Dear Patriots, before the news starts, please, subscribe to our patriotic channel by clicking the subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up to this video. Don't forget to leave your opinion below in the comments section. Share the news on Facebook and Twitter so you friends see it. Thank you. Trump lawyer's payment to porn star draws comparisons to John Edwards case. Porn actress Stephanie Clifford's lawsuit against President Donald Trump over a hush money deal struck days before the 2016 election is drawing comparisons to another legal fight involving a politician who had an affair, John Edwards. Edwards saw his reputation savaged when his affair with videographer Real Hunter was revealed during the 2008 presidential campaign, after Edwards' wife had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. But the fallout wasn't just political. Edwards was eventually indicted on six felonies after wealthy donors spent $1 million to cover travel, hotel, medical and housing expenses incurred by Hunter, who was pregnant with Edwards' child. The travel included secretive charter flights arranged to hide the pregnancy. Now, Trump's alleged dalliance with a porn actress has moved beyond tabloid fodder, too, as questions mount about his involvement in a payoff just weeks before Election Day 2016. With Clifford's claim now in court, Trump and his associates could be forced to answer questions under oath and turn over documents about his involvement in the arrangement and what his role was in the $130,000 longtime Trump attorney Michael Cohen arranged to pay to the adult film star in October 2016. The key legal question is whether the $130,000 was intended to advance Trump's chances in the election. If it was, it should not have been routed through a corporation and might amount to an illegally large campaign contribution. If Trump paid the money in connection with his campaign, it should have been reported on his campaign finance reports. I do think this is moving closer and closer to the territory where Edwards was subject to criminal prosecution, said Hampton Dellinger a former North Carolina deputy attorney general who closely followed the case against the former Democratic presidential hopeful. Edwards was charged in 2011 with conspiracy, accepting illegal campaign contributions and making false statements. A jury acquitted Edwards on one charge and couldn't reach verdicts on the others, although jurors said the vote tallies lean in favor of acquittal on those counts as well. The suit Clifford filed this week argues that Trump must have been involved in directing Cohen to bottle up Clifford's potentially damaging story as well as text messages and photos that may have embarrassed the then-candidate, just as he was dealing with fallout from an old Access Hollywood recording in which he bragged about groping women. It strains credibility to conclude that Mr. Cohen is acting on his own accord without the express approval and knowledge of his client Mr. Trump, Clifford's lawsuit states. The payment would only need to have been included in campaign finance reports if it was related to Trump's candidacy, not if it was for personal reasons. I think the timing of this payment in relation to the campaign and some of the other statements that were supposedly made by Cohen make it a somewhat stronger case that this was not personal, but was campaign-related, said University of California law professor Rick Hasen. It's by no means a sure thing. Cohen said in a statement Friday that Clifford's lawyer, Michael Avnati, has clearly allowed his 15 minutes of fame to affect his ludicrous conclusions. The earth-shattering uncovered email between myself and the bank corroborates all my previous statements, which is I transferred money from one account at that bank into my LLC and then wired said funds to Ms. Clifford's attorney in Beverly Hills, California. Cohen added that he drew on a home equity line of credit to make the payment. In a statement last month he said he used personal funds to facilitate a payment of $130,000 to Clifford. The payment was made through a limited liability corporation in connection with a non-disclosure agreement aimed at silencing Clifford about her involvement with Trump starting in 2006. The payment to Ms. Clifford was lawful, and was not a campaign contribution or a campaign expenditure by anyone, Cohen said in his earlier statement. Through spokespeople, Trump has insisted there was no affair with Clifford. Cohen has not been clear in his public statements about whether Trump knew about or directed the payment. The president has denied the allegations against him, White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders told reporters Wednesday. This case has already been won in arbitration, she added, 
apparently referring to a confidential, private proceeding aimed at enforcing the non-disclosure agreement Clifford and Cohen signed using pseudonyms. Watchdog groups like Common Cause have urged the Justice Department and the Federal Election Commission to investigate the pre-election payment. Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington issued a new call Thursday for probes into the issue in the wake of press reports that Cohen complained to friends that Trump had not reimbursed him for the money sent to Daniels. Cruz said that if Trump owed Cohen the money, Trump should have reported the debt on his financial disclosure form, which does not list any liability to the attorney. A Justice Department spokeswoman declined to say whether the Justice Department is investigating the payment or to identify who in the department would handle such a review. It is long-standing policy of the Department of Justice not to comment on requests to confirm or deny the existence of investigations, regardless of whether there is or isn't one, DOJ spokeswoman Nicole Navas Oxman said. A trial lawyer and friend of Edwards who testified at the ex-Senator's 2012 trial, John Moylan, said it wouldn't be a surprise if federal prosecutors were already figuring out how to investigate Cohen's payment to Clifford. Someone, somewhere in the world of the Justice Department, I would think, is noodling over that as we speak, Moylan said. That would be the factual question to resolve, why was it done? Given the timing, it is a little hard to think the campaign was not a significant motivating factor. One factor that would weigh strongly against any prosecution over the payment to Clifford is that prosecutors never managed to prove their case against Edwards, who was not retried after his acquittal. Moylan said he doesn't think the failure of the Edwards prosecution means the episode involving Cohen and Clifford couldn't be prosecuted, but said he thinks the outcome of the trial would be a factor. I am sure they will look at the facts that mattered in the Edwards case and compare them to the evidence put together here and make a decision about whether to go forward," Moylan said. One open question is who at Justice would conduct such an investigation. Attorney General Jeff Sessions has recused himself from all matters related to the 2016 election. That would presumably include the payment to Clifford, although officials declined to confirm that Friday. We don't discuss specific issues in the scope of a recusal, DOJ spokeswoman Sarah Isker Flores said. The issue would probably fall to Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, lawyers said. He could potentially assign the issue to Special Counsel Robert Mueller, who is already exploring several subjects related to the 2016 campaign. Rosenstein could also leave the issue to the prosecutors who typically handle campaign related matters the Public Integrity Section's Election Crimes Branch, since any expansion of Mueller's probe seems certain to infuriate Trump. It's not like this can just now die down, said Lawrence Noble of the Campaign Legal Center. This now has a life of its own, pressure is mounting the more that comes out about it. Search for Hicks replacement turns into West Wing food fight. President Donald Trump on Thursday evening poked his head into the James S. Brady briefing room to personally deliver to reporters a heads up about a major announcement on North Korea. It marked his first in person visit to the den of journalists he usually just watches on television, and it came days after his communications director, Hope Hicks, announced her resignation. It was not, however, a sign that the press obsessed, I alone can fix if President is replacing Hicks with himself, as many reporters joked. In fact, the search to take over that job has become something of an internal free-for-all, with aides campaigning for the job, Trump soliciting advice directly from Hicks about who should take over when she's gone, and Chief of Staff John Kelly trying to broaden the search to include some outside candidates. The top candidates emerging from inside the White House, multiple officials said, our Director of Strategic Communications Mercedes Schlapp, a veteran of the George W. Bush administration who has become a Kelly ally in his battle against Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, and Tony Sayeg, Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs at the Treasury Department. Both Schlapp and Sayeg, those officials said, have expressed interest in the job. Sayeg who is close to Treasury Secretary Stephen Nutchen and temporarily worked out of Hicks' office during last fall's tax reform fight, 
has continued wandering over to the West Wing since then for meetings and casual hellos, maintaining a regular presence there. Schlapp, meanwhile, has gained Kelly's trust and is seen as the fallback choice because she has already put together her own external affairs team. But the chief of staff is still also trying to review outside choices. There is also a broad internal base of support for Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders to take on the job, adding overall messaging strategy and the management of a 40-person team to her current portfolio, which includes regular televised briefings. Sanders has expressed some hesitation about taking on both roles, but allies say she is considering it. Meanwhile, National Security Council spokesman Michael Andan is being pushed to take on a bigger communications role in the West Wing alongside whoever emerges as the pick to lead the department. The White House is currently struggling with a mass exodus of top aides, some of whose positions are not expected to be filled after they leave, and some of which have become the top priority, like the search for top economic adviser Gary Cohn's replacement. The search for Hicks' replacement? according to three people familiar with the process, falls somewhere in the middle. Hicks' announcement that she planned to leave the administration didn't move markets like Cohn's. And the White House survived for months with no one serving in the post after former communications director Michael Dubb resigned last May. White House officials said they hoped to be able to announce a replacement by the time Hicks, who has no firm last day on the calendar, departs in a few weeks. Kelly is actively reviewing candidates and views the change as an opportunity to create a more traditional structure for the communications office. The communications shop has long been one of the rockiest departments in the West Wing, with the top job there viewed now as a thankless task of overseeing messaging for a message-resistant, Twitter-happy president. His impromptu newsmaking appearance in the briefing room Thursday was the most recent example of the president calling his own shots when it comes to the press. This communications shop, which is staffed with competent and talented people, faces some of the most significant challenges of any political public relations staffers ever, said Ryan Williams, a former spokesman for Mitt Romney's 2012 presidential campaign. The challenges they face are the direct result of the inability of their principal to stick to the script and maintain a consistent message. For his part, Trump likes to revive names from his original, campaign inner circle when he talks about who should come back into the fold. Jason Miller, a veteran of the 2016 campaign, has been floated internally as a potential candidate for the job. Miller was first tapped for the communications director job during the transition in 2016 but was unable to take the job for personal reasons. He has managed to remain a favorite of the president, though, for his Trump-defending commentary on CNN. But people close to Miller said he would be more inclined to join the administration for a border strategy and policy portfolio. There is widespread acknowledgement inside the West Wing that the role Hicks played is not replaceable. She was one of Trump's closest confidants serving as a resource for colleagues who relied on her help reading the president's moods. Colleagues said they expect that in moments of crisis, Trump will continue to phone Hicks, adding her to the list of advisors he relies on from outside the formal structure of aides, and further complicating the job for whoever steps into her shoes. The White House declined to comment on the search process. The communications job has seen an unprecedented level of turnover. Doug, Trump's first communications director, left the White House after just three months on the job. Former press secretary Sean Spicer briefly filled the position while continuing as top spokesman but resigned when former financier Anthony Scaramucci was chosen for the post. Scaramucci was fired after 10 days. Hicks was seen as a reluctant and inexperienced successor, who came into the position insisting that her job title include the word interim but ultimately lasted longer in the post than any of her Trump administration predecessors. Nancy Cook and Deliana Johnson contributed to this report.